This is the school nurse at Maplewood Middle School, and I've got a student showing signs of sepsis, including altered mental status. Rescue 37 response, 7 Burnett Street, Cut Center 7 Burnett Street, Maplewood Middle School. You have a student at this location with a severe infection. For an 11-year-old male with an altered mental status, possible sepsis. 37 out of Central, receive that. Graham Trusky, 37, respond in Maplewood Middle School. There was a case with an 11-year-old boy, went on a camping trip with his family and wound up getting poison ivy. It was itching and bothering him, he kept scratching it, but his mom saw it and said it didn't look too bad, he could go to school. He winds up going to school and it's still bothering him. He's a little distracted, not able to concentrate on class, and he asked to go to the nurse's office. Hi Luke, come sit down next to me. What's the matter? Um. Well, I just don't feel really well, and I accidentally stepped in some poison ivy, and my leg, like, itches. Okay, when did you start not feeling well? Like, first period, I just couldn't focus on the teacher and what she was saying. It was, like, really hard. Okay, so you couldn't focus? That's yeah. unusual for you. Okay. All right, let me take your temperature. She really begins to pick up on some subtle signs and symptoms. Your temperature is up a little bit, so I guess you're not So one of the next well. things she does is take a look at this kid's past medical record, and she sees that, because of a prior injury, he's had a splenectomy. You had a ruptured spleen? Yeah. Okay. An injury to his spleen means that he's immunocompromised, but it really takes a sharp clinical provider like this school nurse to pick on the subtle signs and symptoms that this kid isn't acting quite right. So when she cut off the bandage, she was looking at what might be more than just a simple case of poison ivy. She suspected that this might be something like a staph infection. Now we're putting together an infection, an altered mental status, we've raised the possibility of sepsis. Anyone can get an infection, and almost any infection can lead to sepsis. Pediatric sepsis is the number one killer of children globally. Even in the United States, there are more than 72,000 cases per year and more than 6,800 children die from sepsis. Sepsis is the body's overwhelming and life-threatening response to an infection that can lead to tissue damage, organ failure, and death. At its most basic, sepsis is identifying that the patient has an infection and altered vital signs. First responders and pre-hospital caregivers are often the first to encounter sepsis patients, so it's critical that they recognize the signs and symptoms of sepsis and are able to carry forward a care plan. When we're looking for signs and symptoms, we're looking for changes in heart rate, oxygen levels, changes in respiratory rate, changes in mental status, blood pressure that is hypotensive, so low, that's a very late stage of sepsis. When we reach those levels that we have multiple organs dysfunctioning, there are things that manifest individually that map to those organs. So for example, I can see very low urine output uh, and changes that are indicating I have kidney damage. A common misconception is that every child with sepsis, or even every child with an infection, is going to have a high temperature. Not every infection produces fever. So when you take the patient's temperature and it's normal or cold, it doesn't mean that they don't have an infection. It doesn't mean that they don't have sepsis. In fact, a particularly cold child can mean that this child has septic shock and it's getting even worse. Unfortunately, there's no one single set of a criteria or one single test that could tell you if a patient has sepsis or not. That makes it a real challenge in being able to diagnose it. So I may have to really undergo a period of observation in that hospital because the risk is there. And that kind of observation happens often with neonates especially. Um, it's so important to watch how they're progressing over time. Luke, you need immediate medical attention. So I'm gonna call an ambulance, then I'm gonna call your mom, all right? And we'll make sure that you get what you need right away. Okay. okay? This is the school nurse at Maplewood Middle School and I've got a student showing signs of sepsis. When first responders find a child where they suspect sepsis, it's really quite simple. They have to say, I suspect sepsis. He's got an increased pulse, a fever, increased respiratory rate. Sepsis is a medical emergency that begins outside of the hospital in 80% of cases. We're talking about hours making the difference with life and death. Hi, I just want to let you know Luke's feeling really ill. His poison ivy looks really infected. It looks infected. 
I have called EMS. We do need him to have immediate medical attention. Why? What happened? The school nurse contacts the mom to let her know what's going on and to let her know that it's something that's going to require her son to go to the emergency department and receive some emergency care. Okay, what hospital would you like him to go to? Maplewood Memorial. You're just going to meet the ambulance there? Thanks. Okay, okay bye, -bye. bye. The first responder to arrive is a police officer. Hi, Julie. How are you today? Hi. Fine, thanks. I'm what, glad you're here. What's going on? We've got Luke Miller over here. We're showing signs of sepsis. Okay. So he starts putting ambulance. together the key information to be able to share with the EMTs and the paramedics. Okay, just hang tight, okay? Okay. Do you have his uh, information? Yes, all his information right there. Okay, okay, great. There are certain populations of children who are at higher risk for infection. Those include kids who are born prematurely, kids with chronic medical conditions such as cancer or congenital heart disease, kids with medical devices, and kids with immune deficiency. Also, newborns are at higher risk for infections that can lead to sepsis. Parents with children of special health care needs really need to understand the vulnerability of their children to sepsis. The American Academy of Pediatrics has an emergency information form, and being able to document it can really mean they've shortened the time to ultimate interventions. Being a pre-hospital provider gives you these challenges when you're dealing with any kind of sick patient, but especially with a child who you must advocate for, who you must understand all these nuances. You alone are gonna have the first opportunity to intervene, to communicate, and to make sure you have triggered the resources necessary to rescue that child. This is Medic 256 uh, calling in a sepsis alert. When we're dealing with a newborn patient, you have to keep in mind the possibility that this patient picked up congenital infections, uh, possible infections that they got from mom, maybe even during the birthing process. Even when a child's a little bit older, up to three months old, every baby's immune system is still developing. So basically, any child under 90 days old is considered immunocompromised. There are children with chronic illnesses that um, also remain vulnerable. Such as them being on chemotherapy or having acquired immune deficiency syndrome or AIDS. Some children with pediatric asthma may be on corticosteroids. And those steroids, uh, anti-inflammatory medications, can also suppress their immune response. It can certainly make it more likely that they're going to get infections, especially respiratory infections, which cause approximately 50% of the cases of sepsis. The real challenge is with the otherwise healthy population. We know that mortality rates can exist somewhere in one to four percent in otherwise completely healthy children. So we need to be as attentive to those children that don't have a history of chronic illnesses and don't already fall into those categories as we are those that do. Because it could be very, very subtle the way that they present their signs and symptoms. And what we want to do is be able to focus on how they're compensating, how they're trying to keep their organs working while the septic reaction slowly eats away at their ability to, frankly, stay alive. When the EMTs and the paramedic arrive, their goal is to gather the information as quickly as possible, to get a patient picture and understand, basically, what's going on. And he's getting worse while we're here. Here he's 11 years old, he's showing signs of sepsis. You want to make sure that that's the first thing that you say when you're giving a radio report or a face-to-face -face report. This is a sepsis alert. Altered mental status. They're able to work with the police officer and the school nurse to identify the key information to get them an accurate patient picture. This is going to allow them to begin focusing the rest of their assessment and to begin treatment as soon as possible. All right, we're going to get your vital signs real quick and get you ready to go. He had poison ivy. It was important for them to obtain initial vital signs, including pulse, blood pressure, respirations, pulse oximetry, and more. This way, they're going to be able to identify trends and see whether the patient is getting better or worse. Have you noticed that you've been peeing OK recently? Yeah. All right. 76 pounds, 4 feet 11 inches. OK, this is just going to go We're talking about little not little being little. able to focus. Be this is a sharp kid, so he's definitely not himself. One really important thing that you should know, two years ago, um, he had a ruptured spleen and a splenectomy, so he's okay. definitely immunocompromised. Thank you.
it's really important that we start with the patient's complaint. We really drill down with their medical history, especially when we're taking the patient in from family members, caregivers, school nurses, pediatrician's office, family medical centers, is we're really getting all of the information that we can. Children of any age are going to not be able to tell you as well what exactly is going on with them. When you're dealing with infants, they're going to be able to tell you even less and you're really going to need to rely on a rock solid assessment and a really good patient history. Medications they're on, how they were born, when they were born, if any problems were encountered uh, from the time they were born up till now. We can't let those bits of information go unnoticed. Now, not everything is going to be sepsis, but we wanna make sure that that is top of our list when we're assessing this patient. One, two, three. If the first responder can accurately identify risk, uh, there's no greater control of the destiny of that child than being able to say, we got them the most rapid, accurate care possible. <laughs> On the way to the hospital, the boy's condition started to deteriorate. The paramedic needed to continue treatment, but needed to be very careful in each step of the treatment. Not to slow anything down, but to make sure that each step was being evaluated to see if he was slowing the deterioration, balancing off, or maybe even improving. While we want to be aggressive with our treatment, we want to make sure that we don't go too far. This is a very delicate balance, and a lot of patients, especially those with underlying conditions, could be particularly fragile. Too much treatment can be just as bad as not enough. Blood pressure 70 over 40, heart rate is 160. The paramedic was administering fluids rapidly, and deciding that if this patient didn't turn around, they were going to need to move on to pressor medications. Hey doc, this is medic 256 uh, calling in a sepsis alert. The paramedic called a sepsis alert and this let the emergency department physician know that she and her team were going to have to be ready to meet this patient as soon as they arrived at the hospital. Pediatric code sepsis, ETA five minutes. Pediatric code sepsis, ETA five minutes. Reassessing the vital signs is crucial to be able to determine what the trend is in the patient's overall condition, especially with pediatric patients going into shock. They can decompensate, they can deteriorate very, very quickly. Blood pressure 70 over 40, heart rate is 160. These patients try and sustain their blood pressure and their cardiovascular status for as long as they can, but when they run out of reserves, their vital signs can drop immediately. When these altered vital signs begin to become so severe that indicates cardiovascular collapse, this patient is starting to spiral down, then that's septic shock. Some of the most common misconceptions about sepsis is that uh, sepsis can only occur with heavily, heavily bacterially infected people, but it's really the body's response gone haywire that's doing that. In the old days, a lot of times, sepsis was referred to as blood infection. Um, but the problem with that definition is it makes us think that the problem is isolated to the blood. For out-of-hospital providers, the other issue is that if it's a blood problem, you're not really thinking about the organ dysfunction uh, and the things that you can actually do something about. We want to make sure that when we hand off the patient and the information at the hospital, that we're doing it as efficiently as possible. We want to make sure that we're giving them the key information that they're going to need to keep up that momentum of care, because time is absolutely critical with these patients. This is the 11-year-old male uh, from school, a sepsis alert. Um, the paramedic delivers his face-to-face -face report to the emergency department physician and her team, allowing them to continue the care that's already begun in the field, plus any additional care that might be needed, such as blood cultures, antibiotics, or any correction of electrolytes or other problems that the patient might have. Okay guys, let's get the fluids hung. Let's draw some labs, including the lactate level and the blood culture, and let's get the Vanco and the Recephin started stat. Okay, got it. The school nurse was able to put together some very subtle signs and symptoms in the beginning and knew that this was a child who needed a 911 call. This was a child who needed to go to the emergency department, not back to class. The police officer began to gather the key information. The EMTs and the paramedic began their assessment early on, suspecting sepsis, beginning their treatment for sepsis, and coordinating right away with a sepsis alert with the emergency department. The emergency department staff was ready to receive that sepsis alert and pick up the ball, continue that momentum of care, and do everything possible to make this a positive outcome. 
if everyone wasn't working on the same page, if anyone wasn't as sharp as they needed to be, this might not have been a positive outcome at all. Oh. All right, you turn it back. Prevention of infection, rapid recognition. And students showing signs of sepsis. And effective treatment remain the keys to sepsis prevention and sepsis survival. People don't really understand the word sepsis. It doesn't carry the same emotional impact than when we hear about a child with cancer. That evokes a completely different emotional response. We have to be able as healthcare providers to say, I'm gonna overcome that reluctance to say, I believe this child has sepsis and this is what we need to do. It is concerning that sepsis cases are not decreasing the way we would like them to. And clearly much work remains to be done. So when we think about the strategies that have really made the biggest difference over the last two decades. It has all been about minimizing variation in practice. So we have protocols in place that are gonna allow us to rapidly identify this child with sepsis. The second piece of that protocol is having the right teams, having a pediatric readiness with the equipment. That's number three. Use of pediatric sepsis care guidelines by pre-hospital providers is shown to reduce mortality by 40 to 47 percent. Code sepsis ICU. Code sepsis ICU. We're changing our infrastructures so that they're more responsive. There's a greater team effort. There's a greater communication. There's a greater standardization to minimize unwanted variation in the way that we approach these children. Now, if we can get that to spread, we'll have really made a difference across the nation.